This is story of a British general practitioner who was a convicted fraudster, and suspected serial killer. Between 1946 and 1956, 163 of his patients probably died while in a coma, so deemed to be worthy of investigation. In addition most of his patients had left Adams money or items in their wills. John Bodkin Adams was born and raised in Randall's town, Ireland, into a deeply religious family of Plymouth Brethren. His father, Samuel, was a preacher in the local congregation and by profession was a watchmaker. He also had a passionate interest in cars, which he would pass on to Adams. In 1896 Samuel was 39 years of age when he married Ellen Bodkin, aged 30. John was their first son. In 1914 Adams' father died of a stroke. After attending Coleraine Academical Institution for several years, Adams matriculated at the Queen's University of Belfast at the age of 17. He graduated in 1921, having failed to qualify for honours. In 1921, Surgeon Arthur Rendell Short offered Adams a position as assistant houseman at Bristol Royal Infirmary. He spent a year there but did not prove a success. On Short's advice, Adams applied for a job as a general practitioner in a Christian practice in Eastbourne, Sussex. The middle-aged Dr. Adams was not known to be an outstanding practitioner, but he was recognized as being compassionate and considerate, particularly to his elderly patients who trusted him. There were, however, other aspects about his modus operandi that caused concern, mainly his tendency to use dangerous drugs and, what some critics have described, a pathological interest in his patients' wills. In dealing with the wealthy, his common approach was to mention that if he sent a bill, the money he received would be highly taxed, but if the patient were to remember him in her will, any bequests were not taxable. His second line was to suggest that if there were no relatives, the patient might consider leaving money to charity, but as there were so many scams, they could leave money to him, and he would see that it went to worthy causes. Using this technique, Dr. Adams received money from a total of 350 wills, and was left large amounts of property, jewels, silverware and two Rolls Royces. It also made him the target of rumor, jealousy, and even hatred. It was medical gossip that once you had made out a will in Dr. Adams' favor, you would not live long. These rumors became prevalent enough to trigger a police investigation, firstly over two patients. Edith Alice Morrill was a patient of Dr. Adams who had been partially paralyzed after suffering a stroke. Adams supplied her with a cocktail of heroin and morphine to ease her discomfort, insomnia, and symptoms of cerebral irritation that was a condition of her illness. However, three months before Morrill's death on November 13, 1949, she added a clause to her will stating that Adams was to receive nothing. Despite this clause Dr. Adams, who maintained that Morrill had died from natural causes, still received a small amount of money, cutlery, and a Rolls Royce. The second alleged victim of Dr. Adams did not occur until seven years after Mrs. Morrill had died. Gertrude Hullett was another patient of Dr. Adams who fell ill and then into unconsciousness. Despite not even being dead, Dr. Adams called a local pathologist, Francis Camps, to make an appointment for an autopsy. When Camps realized that Hullett was still alive he accused Adams of extreme incompetence. On July 23, 1956, Gertrude Hullett died and Adams recorded the cause of death as having been the result of a brain hemorrhage. An official investigation however, arrived at the conclusion that she had committed suicide. Camps argued that she had been poisoned with sleeping pills. Like Mrs. Morrill before her, Hullett left several valuable items to Dr. Adams including a Rolls Royce. She died one day after giving him a check. Dr. Adams cashed the check on the same day, the bank clerk said at the time that the signature was very feeble, but Dr. Adams reassured him that the patient was very sick. Shortly after the death, 
the police were suspicious enough, that a warrant was obtained to search Dr. Adams' house for drugs. It appears that the death of Hullett in 1956 precipitated a state of affairs that was to bring Adams to the attention of the authorities. The gossip in the town finally led the police to investigate and they arrested Adams on suspicion of murder. The general rumors were that Adams' bedside manner was to persuade a wealthy widow to write a will which left him money before administering a lethal concoction of drugs. The police investigated for several months during 1956. Then on October 1 of that year they confronted Dr. Adams with their suspicions concerning the death of Mrs. Morrill. In his defense Adams argued that his ill patient, suffering terribly from pain, wanted to die. He argued that it wasn't a crime to ease the suffering of the terminally ill. But it was the legacies left in the patient's wills that caused the police to remain suspicious over Adams' motivations. On April 15, 1957, it took the jury only 45 minutes to find Adams not guilty. Another count of murder was withdrawn by the prosecution in what was later described as an abuse of process by the presiding judge Sir Patrick Devlin, causing questions to be asked in Parliament about the prosecution's handling of events. Despite the not guilty verdict, the police still thought Adams was guilty, not just of two murders, but the deaths of many patients. The press appeared to share this opinion. A Fleet Street journalist at the time is known to have said that word on the street was that Adams had killed so many, and seemed so likely to kill so many more, that the police had been obliged to prosecute even though their case was not quite ready. After the trial Adams resigned from the National Health Service. He was later convicted that same year for forging prescriptions, and ordered to pay a fine of £2,200. As a result he was struck off the medical register. Adams spent his remaining days in Eastbourne, in spite of his tarnished reputation with some still believing that he had murdered at least eight people. Others, notably patients and friends, remained convinced of his innocence. In 1961, he was reinstated as a general practitioner. On July 4, 1983, Adams died aged 84. At the time of his death, his fortune was £402,970. He had been receiving legacies until his death.